Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, it's an honor to have Manish Kothari. He's co-founded several successful companies. First of all, he was president and co-founder of Alpha Smart Inc., which is an education technology company. He was there for over 12 years and helped build and grow the $40 million business. He was part of the executive team during Alpha Smart Inc.'s IPO in 2004 and the subsequent acquisition of their company by Renaissance Learning in 2005. He was also co-founder of Route One, which was acquired by Edmodo, which provides students and teachers a free and easy way to connect and collaborate. He also, if that wasn't enough, he also serves as board member at Minecrest and was on the board at water.org. Manish, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Jeremy. This is truly a, a, both an honor and, and a pleasure. Thank you. And I, you know, I want to hear, I'm really excited to hear your big lessons, your mistakes along in your journey to success, what worked, what didn't work. I always like to start off with a fun fact. And a fun fact, Manish, about you, what you were saying is you are a high altitude trekking and yeah. you like to go to Burning Man. So what's been a crazy experience from when you went to Burning Man? Oh, there's, there's, Burning Man has so many crazy experiences, Jeremy, but I'll tell you one, and I think it reflects, uh, well, or maybe a couple, because it reflects sort of the, the range of things that Burning Man means to me. And one um, that particularly stands out is just the impromptu nature of sharing out there and the, how the sharing is a big part of the culture. And, and people literally share everything. And there's this great bar called uh, Ashram Galactica, where... The bartenders, if you can imagine, they bring all the alcohol, they bring all the drinks, everything. And the only thing that they request when you go up to their bar and say, I want whatever, is that they say the exact question you asked me. Tell me something. Tell me a story about yourself before I'm going to serve you a drink. And mm -hmm. then you start to get to know the bartenders and the others and the people around you. And, and people are sharing all the time. We, When we go to Burning Man, we make chai for everyone. I'm from India, so we typically make chai. But the other aspect, which I'll make this very quick, is is just the beauty in in the in the many sort of artistic and uh, you know musical sort of talents that people have. And a simple one is there's this beautiful um, um, uh, art piece that is really a string of balloons with LEDs, and it goes up into the night sky. And when you see it, it looks like a little stairway to heaven. It's actually beautiful. Oh, wow. So wow. it's it's quite a, quite an amazing experience. And for those who are inclined, I would I would absolutely recommend it. All right, I'll definitely be making my trek there one of these days. I'll say hello to you in person. Um, I want to hear where this all started too, and tell me about where did you grow up? What was a big influence for you uh, in your childhood? So interesting. I, I grew up in Bombay, India. And I came to the U.S. to actually study, go to college a uh, little over 30 years ago and have been here since. And my childhood in India was, you know, not unlike probably many of my friends. We all went to a school and we were in one group. So we got very close to, to our friends. And clearly some of the folks who sort of influenced me um, a lot besides my parents were actually my friends themselves. And I'm very, very close to them. And we've stayed in touch. And it, it turned out because we were a close-knit group for so many years that you actually get to know them mm. and their parents and all very well. And uh, growing up in Bombay in the 70s was actually a pretty delightful experience. Bombay was not as big as it is today, and uh, but still very, very active. And I actually, unlike a lot of people, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, even in, like, say, high school, it wasn't like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. And I have a funny story about that that yeah. I'll tell you. And the example is... Uh, finally, when I reached the stage um, of going to college, I said I want to be an engineer. And that uh, people all smile because I think our entire class back at then, the graduating class, wanted to be engineers or doctors or lawyers. <laughs> you know, it's a very sort of predictable set. There were few people who said I want to be a musician right. or an artist. And uh, um, that was just the state of I to go to specific things. Um, a very sort of heavy bent on practicality. But what's interesting is after five and a half years of engineering, I realized I wasn't a good engineer and I didn't want to be an engineer. So I went to business school. So my first story is it's okay to not know. And in fact, I was quite confused um, even through my undergraduate and graduate degrees in engineering. Yeah, that's how I found you actually because I went to Madison and you went to Madison for a stint as well. What was the, was there any culture shock when you came from India and moved to the U.S. for school? 
Absolutely. I mean, I actually had never been, Jeremy, outside of India except for once uh, when I was only six years old and we went to Africa, which which is a beautiful, beautiful place. We went to Kenya and Tanzania and, and to Uganda, but um, and it was for a holiday, so I'd never been outside of of the of India. And when I first came, it was a culture shock in many ways. You know, I mean, the culture that we expected, or I should say, I expected, was what you normally saw in the movies, and somewhat watered down because you know the movies. Movies and uh, but uh, this is an interesting fact at Brigham Young University, and I'm not. And so there was a culture shock not only coming to the U.S., but uh, on top of that, there was a shock in terms of just how the Mormon subculture is. Um, and then so in many ways, but what's great about America, I feel, um, is that they are very open about different ideas and different things. And to me, that is one of America's greatest strengths. Uh, and, and so it was, in some ways, it was, yes, a culture shock, but in many ways, it was an opening up as well. Yeah. So... You obviously, you know, kind of took your engineering career and you said, this isn't for me. How did you actually, when did you get started and how did you get started with AlphaSmart? So I got, and tell I got people a little bit about what AlphaSmart is for people who yes. don't know. So, so I'll tell you first what AlphaSmart is and then I'll tell you about how it got started. Yeah. But AlphaSmart um, uh, uh, is an ed tech company uh, that, that we were associated, as you pointed out, for 14 years. But... Um, it, it actually, we manufactured a, a, what we call a smart keyboard. And is, think of it as a full-size keyboard with a small display of about four lines and 40 characters, extremely portable and rugged. And uh, it, it ran on just about, you know, three AA batteries for an entire school year. And the basic benefit of AlphaSmart is at the time, this is in the early 90s, most elementary and middle school children had access to computers in a computer lab maybe for half an hour to about an hour a week, just because there were not enough computers. So you went to a lab and you got maybe up to an hour a week to mm. practice keyboarding, to learn how to type, to do word processing, note taking. So we created this to be a smart companion to computers, but at a much, much reduced cost. So it was like one tenth of the cost and was never meant to be a computer. So we didn't try to design a sort of a scrub down laptop or a low end laptop. We, may, we just made the keyboard a smart keyboard, and that was a critical, mm. sort of, in my mind, a critical differentiation, and uh, and we were lucky. So that's that's the product we sold to schools and districts across the country and eventually around the world. But the way it got started, and I got lucky um, on this, Jeremy, is that my brother and another friend were working at Apple in, in the late 80s and early 90s, and they were tinkering around with different ideas most of which didn't really go too far until they found this idea, the idea of a smart keyboard on a bulletin board in 1991. And this is from a group of educators around the Seattle area in the Northwest. And they knew they could build it. So they actually built it, a prototype, and their whole point was they'll take it up to their leadership in, in Apple. And then either it'll get accepted and they'll become heroes or they'll get some recognition or some, you know, whatever, bonuses. And that was their game plan. Well, Apple decided in their wisdom, and I, I, I can agree with that, is that it was not really a computer with a Macintosh OS, nor was it really a peripheral like a printer or keyboard. It was sort of in between, and really they didn't have a bucket. And But for us, luckily, they said, uh, they gave us in what is known as an idea release and said, as long as you develop this on your own time, not on Apple's time, you can do it. And I got involved because of my brother and this other friend of ours, and I was the first full-time person. So... By the time I moved here, they'd already gotten enough validation, and I moved here to start shipping it and all, and I could break away easily. But that's how I got started in Alpha. Yeah, so I saw that um, Joe and your brother is Keaton? Yes. Keaton, yeah. They, so did they at that point go, did they develop it on their own time? Did they quit? What did they do? Because yeah, obviously a, they brought you on pretty early. It's a very great question because, you know, Jeremy, now in the Valley, we have uh, a lot of people who get money. They get where either, you know, seed or angel funding or they even get sometimes uh, more significant funding and they're actually able to break away uh, from their full-time jobs. In Joe and Ketan's case, they were not able to do that because we simply had not raised any funding. We, we basically got funding from Joe's grandparents, Joe's parents, our parents and whatever little savings the three of us had which wasn't much. And, and all of that, to give you an idea, was about $100,000 in 1991. And that was enough to make the mold, the tool, 
uh, for the Alphas. I remember we were making a hardware product with, with yeah. you know, plastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll plastic. link up a pic. I'll put a picture on there so people can kind of see, which you yep. can see on Wikipedia also, but yeah. Yes, yes. And so, yes, there's a Wikipedia entry. I'll also send you, I'll send you after this interview, I'll send you a case that was done by um, by the Clayton Christensen Institute uh, for um, disruptive disruptive innovation, and they 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 took this as an example of disruptive innovation because it was not really a computer, not a not a keyboard. And I'll send that to you. But the point is that um, at that point, Ketan and Joe still continued to work uh, at Apple and did it on weeknights and weekends. And Joe took a sabbatical and spent three months just working on this full time as well. Yeah. So what made you decide to join them? Because you went to school, you got your master's, and then you went and got your MBA. And then yep. you joined them. You could probably get a number of jobs or do whatever you want. Why did you decide to join them? It's a good question. Actually, after my MBA, I did, I did go and work uh, with a medical device manufacturer, which was at the time a, a subsidiary of Eli Lilly, in, and this was in the Twin Cities. So I worked there for three years, and my choice at the time, I worked in product marketing and then uh, for a specific product team. So it was more marketing related, but on the product management side. And my choice at the time after having worked there for three years, so this is now 1993, uh, was to go out and become a salesperson. So you go out in the field and try to get some real customer uh, interaction um, uh, experience. And then typically after that, you'd come back into the corporate and hopefully rise up the corporate ladder. But at the time, Ketan and Joe needed someone full time. And both of them were already married at the time. I was single. And they said that, do you want to, they gave me the Steve Jobs line is, do you want to keep, you know, selling pacemakers to doctors that you want to come and make a real difference? And uh, I thought that would be, it was a risk worth taking. Uh, you know, we had enough savings for me to live with my brother for about a year and still on his salary and our savings somehow make it. And the way I looked at it, if worse comes to worse in a year, if really this weren't going anywhere, then I would look for a job or even go back to my previous job. Yeah. So when you came on board, and I remember reading, you know, Steve Jobs' um, biography, it was even hard for a big company like that to get traction and to produce hardware. So how did you, what were some of the pitfalls early on? Because you came on, what did you do? And yeah. what, what were they doing with the, the mold? I mean, you spent a lot of money on this mold. Yeah, so that's that's another great question. So even before the mold, you're talking about pitfalls and some of the early things. So if I was already helping them, um, you know, also on weeknights and weekends from from the Twin Cities where I was working, mm -hmm. and um, we almost went under. Uh, and and what we had done initially is because we didn't have the money. I mean, we didn't have money for the mold that came a little later. We actually contracted an existing company that had a clamshell that basically would fit our design you know it wasn't our design but would fit the need and they had a keyboard a small display and joe our partner who was the main technical uh, person he designed the the hardware and you know obviously the firmware and software to fit inside those plastics that already existed mm -hmm. and then we contracted this company based in hong kong to actually just manufacture it for us in small runs we obviously didn't have enough money for inventory and work work in process so we did all of that and we even had a purchase order out to them for the first 500 units over some period of time. And at the last minute, they basically rescinded on the deal. They, they just uh, really? said no. And there was nothing we could do. This company is based in, in Hong Kong. There's no no way you can take legal action other than... Did you pay you them know. or... No, we didn't. We did not pay them. That was the good news. But you lost know, this, a lot of this, time. The biggest thing is we lost time and we almost went under because these customers were waiting for delivery. In fact, they, they had already placed orders with us. So we actually got delayed by almost another nine months. And that was probably the first really sort of critical time where we almost went under. That's when we developed the mold, finally got a product out and can convinced about 80% of our customers to stick with their rather than cancel them. So that's a good point that you bring up, which is how do you get orders early on before you even have the product? So that's a that's a great question. So we ha only had some prototypes, um, and uh, these prototypes were very few. And and that's when I realized, you know, when we were working very early on, that we actually had orders for this on based on prototype. We, the, these were functioning prototypes, so they worked exactly as you know the final product would. That that we were onto something because when you already have established that these people are willing to pay you on the basis of a prototype, that already had removed risk. Um, uh, in my mind and our minds away from uh, from that. But even so, 
it was not that easy to raise funding. So it's kind of interesting back in the early 90s, you know, again, this is with we had no experience really in terms of fundraising and the environment was different. And since you don't have any bank, uh, you don't have any banking history, even going and raising capital from a bank is not that easy when you don't have more than a year's worth of operating mm. history. So all that was pretty challenging, but we again got lucky, and um, and at the time that was, it turned out the timing was great, and we decided to just you know keep at it, and you know that's that's what one thing led to another. So what companies did you? Because you did a lot of the the sales, right? Yeah. And you, so, who so, did you target? And tell me about one of those meetings that you realized early on that this is definitely going to get traction. So two stories out there. Um, so I, I was overseeing as the first full-time person. Uh, I was overseeing, you know, what we call everything until we brought someone on. And since we had, since we had actually inventory and we bought, believe it or not, all the little electronic components and the plastics and the bat, you know, the this displays the uh, the glass displays that go into this. We used to buy it at the time in very small uh, quantities because we couldn't afford to buy a lot of inventory. And then we had a local manufacturer. This is another great thing about being in the valley is someone who was willing to do these very low volumes on only on like one uh, half day on a Saturday. And, and that was uh, that kind of flexibility is really key for people like us because you, we couldn't promise larger volumes. We couldn't have that money, much money tied up. But from a sales perspective, going back to your question, what we realized, and this was again, it just it worked out the way it is. We finally, when we got the product, we were very happy. We had some orders flowing, and we said, "This is great. This is working well. Product is validated. We had a few hundred units shipping every month, and uh, making making good money on each unit. You know, profitable and all that." Uh, Apple at the time already had a network of, of what they called sales agents. These were independent uh, entities that, that sold Apple products, typically computers, keyboards, printers, just specifically to schools and school districts. And we said, great, this channel already exists. We just have to reach out to these same folks and they'll push it out for us. And of course, that didn't work as well as we had hoped because, again, the product was no no sort of pull for it. We had to create that sort of... Uh, pull because it wasn't a category that was well understood and certainly the the sales agencies Apple sales agents while they would be happy to resell a product they weren't actually helping create the demand so what that did for us it forced us to go to trade shows at the time directly and to actually build the awareness and create that pull and and fortunately for us as a result of those efforts we then realized and, and started sort of inadvertently, if you will, or accidentally, we became a direct re a seller. So we had no channel partners except for international channel partners because that was harder to get to. So we ended up, uh, because of this sort of roundabout nature and where we ended up, which is being a direct seller, mm -hmm. number one, we kept a much greater share of the profits. But more importantly, we were much more in tune with what our customers wanted. So that, mm -hmm. that story was a critical thing in terms of sales. Um, Another turning point in sales, just as a validation, you were asking, so at what point did you say that this is going to be, uh, back in November of 1993, uh, there was a very early meeting with three school districts uh, in the Denver area, with uh, with Denver Public Schools, the Cherry Creek Public Schools, and, and with Boulder Valley Public Schools. And the three of them got together and placed what was, at the time, our largest order for about 500 units. And we, I remember the deal because it was done on a, on, a, on a paper napkin in a restaurant. And I couldn't believe it. I thought these guys were like just, you know, stringing me along just to get a good price. They're saying, oh, we're going to buy 500 units. What's your best price? And I, I sure enough, I gave, we gave them a good price. And I fully expected they would only do half or less. And they actually came up with 750 units. So that was one of the biggest deals we had very well, early on. How did you get in front of them in the first place? So, so again, luckily, because uh, in our business, um, so there's two things that we did. One is uh, the moment we had enough units built, not prototypes, these are final units, we actually had a very liberal, what we call loaner program. So we sent it out to whomever requested it free of charge. So this is literally a piece of hardware that we used to send by UPS or FedEx. Yes, it is. And, and But schools are very trustworthy here. And people, when you tell them this is a loaner and you can send it back in three weeks or four weeks or whatever, they would always do that. And that allowed people to actually see it. And, mm. and the best part about what Ketan and, and Joe did is the design, again, 
the simplicity, the big innovation that we had was, again, it was not meant to be a computer. Everything else in that category was complicated and worked like a computer. In our case, you just typed something and it stored it as you typed and you could, of course, view it with four lines at a time, edit it, but you actually connect it as a keyboard to any computer and literally press one button and it would, it would actually emulate a keyboard so you didn't need any special software, you didn't need any to do any transfer, you just open up Microsoft Word or whatever you had and press the send button and it would send it all. Yeah. So it was so simple that once you got it into people's hands, so we made it very easy to get them to just try it out, so to speak, free of charge. And uh, that usually converted them and at least got us a meeting. So that's mm -hmm. how I got in front of the, the key yeah, player. That's smart. Yeah, you send it, you let them try it, they're feeling it, they use it, and they like it. So what was the price point at the time? At the time when we introduced it was $270 a unit, and we would give discounts down to about 249 mm -hmm. uh, when they bought in bulk, you know, 10 or more. And then eventually, uh, years later, that price point came down to under uh, under $100 when bought in, in quantities of 30 or more. Yeah, at that like over 200 price point, just to give people um, a kind of direct relation, what were computers at the time? That's a great question. Computers at the time, uh, desktops were somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000, and laptops were over $3,000. Yeah, and, and the other thing, you know, when you say all this, um, you know, you have sale, you have to get sales, you have this product and I'm thinking, how do you even logistically send it to people? What were you doing logistics wise? Cause you're just three people. Yep. Yep. So logistics wise, we used to have, again, so one, one thing again is this, the, the ability in the Valley to have these partners who not only manufacture in small runs, but then we had another contracted organization that would do the logistics, which is actually shipping. So we would literally print out the labels, the recipients for all the different shipments on a weekly basis and, you know, send it to them or drive it over to them. They were about 15 minutes away here in Fremont and uh, they would then ship it out. Once they shipped it out, we would invoice them. So, again, having an ecosystem of such expertise that, that, that are willing to do it on a small volume is crucial for a, for a small company. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as I mentioned in the first part of the, the interview, you know, you grew it and took the company public. So what were some of the milestones going from that big order in Colorado to taking it public? That's a big, um, I mean, we're talking over 12 years. What right. were some of those milestones? So, so another great question. So first of all, that big order in Colorado almost again shut us down. As, I, as you know, we, don't, we didn't have any inventory. Right. So it took us almost 12 weeks to deliver uh, that one order, the large order. It was a good problem, as we say, to right. have. Uh, but having having gone through that, we were lucky again to be profitable by about a year into it. So we actually could repay all the loans That's that we amazing. had taken. Yeah. And so from a financial point of view, in 1994, we did about $2 million in business. So 93 wow. is the partial year. We just shipped for five months. And in that five months, we made quarter million. And we, we jumped to revenues of over $2 million the next year. Then we jumped, believe it or not, to $10 million the year after 95. 96 was 18 million. I remember this ramp and it's, it was it's sort of an unbelievable thing. You, you knew that you were on and each year was a profitable year. So it helped us invest in a lot of obviously people and, and, and logistics. But some of the key milestones are... Well, how in, did you go from two to that 10? That seems like, a, again, a big jump. It, it is a big jump. And, and, and there the biggest issues are in lead time for your parts, right? Because, uh, but, but by then when you have money, you can tie up more money in inventory and work in process, which is what we did. We invested mm -hmm. obviously in inventory so that the lead time wouldn't be. And we committed from our suppliers to buying certain long lead time items and being on the hook if we never use them. So, but, but we had enough money to take that risk. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. Luckily, again, because of our logistics partner and the shipping partner, those people scaled as we scaled. So we didn't have to directly. Hold on one second. So we, it we seems to, it just cut out for one second. Let's let it die. Uh... Catch up. Go ahead. You were saying yeah. the logistics partner grew as you grew. So the logistics and the and the um, the manufacturing we outsourced, but we kept all the design, the marketing, the sales, and the support, and then and, and that was easier to grow. Yeah. So what were some of the big milestones and how you yep. reached on the logistic? Yeah, you know, with the logistics and and anything else. 
So, so the biggest milestones were as we, we uh, two, three things from the product point of view, some of the innovations were, you know, besides making the product just even more rugged and the battery life lasting literally like over a school year, we're talking about a thousand hours on three double A's. Wow. We generally stuck to the simple design and, and what we did instead is came up with, so one milestone was this going direct to customers that I've already talked about. Another milestone was packaging 30 of these Alpha Smarts on a cart. And we, we were the first ones in the business to come up with a rolling cart. Now you see that a lot in schools with laptops and with iPads. Sure. And, and we had a hub that allowed a teacher from one computer to manage 30 Alpha Smarts simultaneously to send and receive and all of that. So we did that, I mean, almost 12 years ago. Again, it was another key innovation. But the milestones in terms of the company's sort of um, history is in 99, we were almost at about 25 million in revenue. Wow. And at that time, you know, you, you already, through that kind of profitable growth, you inevitably have different kinds of people approaching you, either to acquire you or to take you to the next step. And we then, at the time, got uh, uh, an outside late stage uh, private equity group uh, whose name is Summit Partners to invest and, and really that investment was more for uh, selling our minority shares. So we sold a small stake, uh, the founders, and we got some liquidity. But Summit Partners really then helped get us then to the next level, which is really helping shape the company to take it public. So they built out a board that was with you know people who had gone through that process, got on a CFO who was very experienced, had taken six companies public. And so the, the investment happened in 99. And then we went public in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so some of the key things as, as revenue kept growing and growing profitably, I think the milestones were clearly bringing on Summit Partners and then taking the company public in early 2004. And then about a year and a half later, I alluded to, we got acquired by another public company, Renaissance Learning, and, right. and they were more software, we were more hardware, and that's how the sort of the marriage happened. So what were some of the, I mean, that's like just huge growth over that period of time. How do you, what were some of the growing pains that you went through? So lots, lots of growing pains. I mean, I think one, one key uh, area always is human resources, is how do you attract talent and, and keep it and, you mm -hmm. know, and so I think if, if you may recall, there was the first bubble in, in, the, in the valley happened in the late uh, mid to late 90s and crashed probably by 2001. Um, and, and so part of the issue was just hiring good technical talent because yeah. we weren't a sexy doc, dot com. And so we ended up opening an office in Utah partly because we had some connections there, but partly also because Novell and some other tech companies there were letting people, good people go. Mm. So so that that was a, a pain. I mean, it's always a pain to get the right and good talent and keep them. And so that's one area I would say. Um, logistically, it was not that hard again because the strength of our I think that was not in terms of, uh, in, in terms of growing pains. But probably the other is when we were at about 25 million in revenues, you know, you always wonder about how to expand your business into new either segments or into new products. And we chose to extend into a more sophisticated, much more computer-like uh, product called the Dana. And, uh, and in hindsight, so it was a product, by the way, based on the Palm OS, you know, so it had a more sophisticated operating system. You could mm. do a lot more with it than you could with just the plain old alpha there are more smart. programs not yeah, just the typing programs, features third party apps yeah. a bigger display obviously a more expensive uh, solution and what we found out is that 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 move going from the simple to the more complex and it, we went into a category that actually was much more competitive so we had a lot more pressure from uh, the the low end laptops Instead, we should have gone into a category that was even simpler and that emerged as a, it's a pretty high growth category of these clickers. I don't know if you've heard of the clickers, but these are things that, you know, initially started with simple responses in the classroom and they were just based on infrared technology, A, B, C, D. Um, and, and you would respond and the, the teacher would immediately get a sense for whether the children understood some concept. Right, right. And that, that, that whole segment grew quite well. It's one that we clearly could have done very well with, but we completely missed. Yeah. So when you first started the company, did you have a grand vision of taking it public and getting acquired? What What was that like compared to what your goals were early on? 
That's a great idea. Great question again. So, Jeremy, no, we did not have a grand vision. What we did know is, of course, I mean, you always dream about, you know, the dream we would have is to see every elementary and middle school child with an alpha smart or at least have access to an alpha smart on a shared basis. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of the stuff we dreamt about. We didn't dream about taking a company public, didn't really know. Um, and then so the vision was much more about making a difference in, in really the lives of, of, of the students that we served and the mm -hmm. teachers and parents that we served. What was that like then when you took the company public? So before I get to that question, yeah. what was really, um, and by the way, I have a little bit more time. We can go maybe until 11, 10 if you have okay. the time. Okay, that's well. great. So, um, um, I think one of the greatest highs is when you, when you create a product and you see it being used and you go and meet your students and teachers and talk to them and they give you this feedback. That kind of high really sort of helps drive and create this positive feedback loop that keeps you going. Right. The going public part uh, was also an incredible step. Uh, we we learned a lot. We we you know obviously talked to a lot of our friends who had taken companies public prior to our taking the company public, and uh, it was it was an incredible obviously experience. Just the going public part, and inevitably the part that you know, as a public company officer, what you have to remind yourself is some at some point you're going to miss earnings. And, and we did as well. And when you miss earnings, you're put in little, into what I call the penalty corner. And it's not very pleasant. And, and Wall Street is, uh, and the hedge fund managers and fund managers can be very, very hard on you. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, going public is both... Uh, it's a lot of pressure. Uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure, but we did it for all the reasons. And I, looking back, it was not only a great learning experience, it was the right thing to do for the company. But it's not, you know, that it's not always going to, you're not always going to show earnings grow year after year. I know some companies have been able to manage that for many years, but inevitably, even a General Electric or a Cisco. It's hard to do, yeah. It will miss earnings, and it yeah. always happens. And I want to get into some of those proud moments, but, but I want to hear about some of your big lessons learned first and some of the mistakes that we haven't talked about yet. What are some of the big lessons, someone out there, because at the time, you're a first-time entrepreneur. This is your first company. What were some of the big lessons you learned and then you took, you know, to route one? Yeah, I think I think um, the one big lesson that, you know, uh, is that basically you have to sort of learn that you don't control everything as much as we'd like to think we control everything. And it really does have impact on how you how you sort of function because a lot of this to some extent is serendipitous you know and, and not no i don't mean it in a religious way or anything i mean it just that sometimes timing and i and it happened to us with both alpha smart as it is an example there was there was a second company that we co-founded between uh, alpha smart and root one and it's called aspen learning and and we didn't talk about it in that case you know Again, it was basically a product that was shipping to the same segment that we thought or we know well, mm -hmm. or we thought we what know well. What was it? Was it a hardware, it, software? What? It was a combination hardware, software. It was actually a server, and it was a version of uh, what we call a learning management system like Blackboard or Moodle. And, and those had become very popular at the university level, but we created um, a product specifically for the K-12 through segment because... What we saw was there were enough low-end laptops and connected devices that we felt a learning management system would actually be very appropriate and would actually ascend. So I think that assumption was right. So we created in our own with our own bias of hardware and you know selling something that that actually you sell for money. We created this server and the product was called Open Classroom and started selling. We got to about ten thousand students a year after Lehman crash. So we launched the product when Lehman crashed. And so I think part of it was the timing was just bad. But the other part, which was interesting that we didn't expect at all, is we didn't move quickly enough to just a cloud-based offering that could be free. And in fact, the company that I'm now at, I feel had some part in putting our previous company out of business, putting, really? which, is, which is a great irony. So Edmodo effectively offered a free version of what we were doing back then. And, ours was and yours just, is a paid version. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we talk about big mistakes and big lessons. So one thing is timing does play a part and you should know when to sort of persevere and know yeah. when to either concede. Yeah. So that that actually, I think we did well at Aspen Learning. We got to about 10,000 students and it was self-funded and we knew we could, were having a hard time growing it. So we actually got out of that business. And, and luckily for us, Pearson acquired some of the assets 
but more importantly, we knew when to stop. You know, at some how did level, you know? How did you know at that point when to stop? It's a great question. I don't think you know exactly the right time, but but we had for about a year been struggling in terms of growing the customer base, and we knew what we could do. For example, at Alpha Smart, right. and even if you don't compare that sort of amazing trajectory that we had at Alpha Smart, you can at least sort of project what you can reasonably do. Uh, you know, with 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 a different uh, product, and we weren't even close to those reasonable assumptions of growth. Yeah, because that seems like a tough thing. Is you know, well, what if I'm just on the brink of that that Colorado order that you got? Yes. You know, and when do you shut it down, or when do you persevere? And and you're right. It's a very difficult thing, and I've seen actually entrepreneurs go both ways. I think some have waited too long and uh, really lost it all. And uh, others who persevered for the right reasons and have been lucky enough, and so I've actually seen it go both ways. So, what's a big lesson you learned from Alpha Smart that you ne- that you then took um, to Root One, which then got acquired by Edmodo? So, I think probably the biggest lesson is to not sort of be filled with your own hubris that you think you know it all because you've been doing it. You know, I mean, after all, we've been in edtech for now 20 years uh, yeah. since uh, Alpha Smart was founded. We were lucky enough to take it public and get acquired by another public company. But I think if you think you know it all because just because you've done it before, right. I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned is that each time the situation is different, timing is different, and it all plays a part. And you can't right. assume just because you did it before and successfully grew a business in edtech, yeah. that means you can do it again. Yeah. So when did you discover that? Did like a... Uh... I often find that a spouse will deflate your head or who, who deflated you? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a great so, so that's why it's really important to have uh, family, spouses, children, you know, others, friends. And I think I would say all of them. I think all of them. What helped. did they say to you? I mean, I think they were just uh, part of it was also the Aspen Learning experience, right? That second company arguably was totally, a, you know, everyone would say, you guys, you know, this is a home run. You know, you understand the business. You've taken a company public. You have the relationships, you know, yeah. You you know the relationship, you know everything. You know the districts to contact and all that logically makes sense, but it didn't do well. So that was itself a learning lesson. I think that reminded us that just because you think you know it or have done it, that doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. And 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 the second thing is, of course, having spouses and close friends and family just remind you that don't get too full of yourself. Yeah, yeah. So what were some of the mistakes that you made along the way that you wish you would have avoided or maybe that kind of launched you to the next level? So one mistake uh, specifically uh, in in uh, Alpha Smart's case, I think, uh, was going to the higher end, the lower end, as I described. The higher end, as opposed to the. Sorry, hold on. It uh, it seems to have um, it's catching catching up for a second. Um, the the higher end as opposed to the lower end. Yeah, and this this was you know I and it's 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 a tough tough um, decision because I think it was still the right decision to to do something. You know, I think you you can ask yourself the question is really should we have done anything? I mean, was it a mistake to do the higher end and or was it should have we have not done anything? Because in hindsight, it's easy to go back and say we could have moved to the clicker market, which was emerging and we didn't know enough about it. So we went to what arguably was the, the the safer space because it was a proven space instead of going down to the clicker market, which was not as well known and was emerging. But I do think so. I think it was a mistake in hindsight, but fundamentally, I think it was still the right thing to do to actually do something, meaning make an action. While we didn't succeed completely in that, we didn't lose money at it. So it's always it's 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 never really a you know it's not that black and white. Right. And I would say that that example is a classic example. I think entrepreneurs face all the time is that you have choices to make, and some of can be of them be disastrous. Others can be. So another mistake I would say that that looking back in all these years is um, you always have the challenge of whether you should do business with friends. After all, I'm in business with. We've been working together, but we contracted uh, with a group that was led by a friend of mine. This is years ago, and and that did not go very well, and and resulted in a lawsuit. So in some of the mistakes you go back and says, could that have been avoided? And I would say that generally, because you also uh, worked with your brother, obviously too. 
Yeah, exactly. And I have been working with my brother. We don't agree. We argue a lot. Um, and, and so that that is still the case. But with this friend, it turned out to be relatively ugly. And, you know, I think sometimes you have to step back and ask yourself, is this something that makes sense given the nature? Or are you just trying to accommodate something uh, because of your own emotions? And I think those are some of the things that I would couch as potentially mistakes that I've made. Yeah. And you mentioned when I, we were... Uh, I had sent you the question about the low point for you and the most painful point. And I know you put the lawsuit. If you yep. again, I don't edit anything out of these interviews. So if you can't, whatever you can talk about that uh, we can learn from would be would be great. Yeah, no, I, I, can, I can tell you. You know, I'll tell you what uh, why it was a low point. Uh, you know, there's of course the moment you become successful. One of the things I've realized in this ca- country is that people sue you for all sorts of frivolous things, and wow. you know, people see you sue you for. And we've had enough lawsuits, you know, happen for all sort of crazy reasons. And when you go public, there are class action lawsuits, and people try to use that as leverage. So that aside, the low point in this one lawsuit was just the fact that it was with a former friend of mine who was who was also very good a good friend and you know sometimes when you go back and you look like was it really worth it and that's that's why it was such a low point it clearly wasn't worth losing a friendship yeah um but that's that sometimes happens and you know again it's it's the way things sometimes work out yeah i mean i guess it it toughens you up because you say it so nonchalantly i think at the time it's not so it's you know it's not so um uh, easy what was one of the when you found out about one of the lawsuits? What was one of the craziest ones that, that you thought this is ridiculous? I can't believe they're they're actually suing over this. Yeah, well, so I'll tell you that. But you're right about you cannot be nonchalant. It took me years to actually get to the point to be nonchalant about this particular lawsuit. It's it's not easy at all. On the on the crazy ones, we had one where a contract manufacturer in Utah sued us because we were giving more business to a a contract manufacturer here in the valley and and it just happened that the contract manufacturer here in the valley was associated with some asian group of of um, their their founders were asian and our director of operations was asian and say they they actually sued us for discrimination oh really yeah i thought that was really that sort of discriminating against Americans for having chosen an Asian manufacturing <laughs> company. Yeah, okay. it's actually pretty laughable. You've heard it all now, right? Yeah. So what, and I, one of the questions too was about a big mistake and you put the Angus King story. Oh, so that was probably, uh, that was probably not bucketed correctly. That was a, a, just one of those great surprise stories. The oh. Angus King story was not a big mistake at okay. all. Okay, go ahead. I, well, I, can, I can tell you about it. but what's Yeah, your, go ahead. What's the Angus King story? So Angus King is a former governor of um, of uh, the state of Maine, and uh, he happened to be uh, touring California, Northern California specifically, for a fundraiser. And he happened to be visiting um, a fellow. He went to Bowdoin College, and and as an alum of Bowdoin, and he went he went to visit Reed Hastings, uh, the CEO of Netflix, who happens to be a Bowdoin uh, alum as well. And at the time, Netflix and we were neighbors. This is in in we were in Los Gatos. And Angus King was the governor was driving by, and uh, he also noticed Alpha Smart. So, literally at about 7:30 in the evening, one it must have been August, so it was late, and we were at work. And someone comes up to our door and knocks on it. And he's wearing a tie and a jacket, and I thought it was a salesperson. So, you know, I, I opened the door and politely asked, "Who are you?" And and you know, I said, "We're you know we're closed." And he said, "Well, is this Alpha Smart, the company that makes that uh, the keyboard with the display?" So I said, "Yes." And he just actually puts out his hand and says, I'm, I'm Governor King from the state of Maine. And I thought it was a practical joke that one of our friends was playing on us because we were, we were trying to get, at the time, Maine had done the first ever uh, large statewide deployment of laptops for middle school. And they bought Apple laptops. This is the first one that they did. It was very, very publicized. You thought someone was pulling your leg and kind of throwing it in your face. Well, what I was doing is we were pushing our, our regional director in the Northeast and telling her that how come we can't get Alpha Smarts at that scale at, you know, the sixth grade level or the elementary school. And we were constantly bugging her. So I thought this was a of exciting thing. But you know what? I'm going to have someone dress up and say he's Angus King and just show up at, at your door. Well, it turned out it was the real thing. And, and he came because his son actually used the Alpha Smart and loved the Alpha Smart. So he knew about it as a parent, not as, as a governor. Hmm. 
and uh, he had a, a chat for about a, an hour and a half about you know how we came up with the whole concept, how much he liked it, and he invited us to uh, on a, on a, an official visit. So we went and had lunch at the state capital in Augusta oh, wow. with him, and went with his staff and visited all these programs across the state. So that was the Angus King story. I like that one. Yeah. So obviously in this journey, you know, you need, you're kind of going through uncharted waters at times. Who are some of your mentors along the way? So clearly, you know, I have always sought advice from close friends, uh, from obviously family, including my brother and parents and wife. Um, I would say those are probably the most frequent contributors and in terms of talking to, I stay in touch. I talk to you about my friends from India and a few of them, I speak with them uh, quite often. And even though they are completely not within the context of my situation, actually sometimes they're great because, because they're not. And then uh, to a, to a probably a smaller extent uh, uh, people or to, to a slightly smaller extent, people here at work, including my co-founders at, at Route One uh, and, and, and folks here at Modo, as well as the board members. We have some pretty accomplished board members here at Modo, including Reed Hoffman, who is co-founder and um, uh, you know CEO of LinkedIn. Of LinkedIn. Yeah. And he worked with my brother at Apple and there are others on our board, but we've known Reed for quite a while. So it's just, you know, it's people who've sort yeah. of been there and gone through yeah. the grind that I, I typically find very, very helpful. Yeah. So what's some of the best advice you've gotten from Reed or, or someone else? From Reed, I think one of the best pieces of advice we've gotten is that, you know, as we entrepreneurs always try to um, create something new and you think you're going to get, uh, we always talk about the product and usually end up as techies talking about the features and, you know, what the benefits we think. And Reed's, I think, biggest advice has always been, tell me about distribution first. How are you going to get to your first whatever stone is? And, you know, in the software world, it might be a million downloads or a million users. In the hardware world, when we were at AlphaSmart, it may be, you know, a lower number, 10,000 whatever students using an alpha smart or whatever it is. Right. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the question of distribution is a very key one because we get so focused on, you know, this is the great new thing that we forget that just if you build it, of course, the cliche goes, they do not necessarily come. Right. And we've seen it firsthand with Aspen Learning. We've seen Reed struggle even in the early days with LinkedIn. So it's not that easy now that when LinkedIn is so successful, it's easy to look back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we knew what we were doing. Uh, same thing for Alpha Smart. You know, when you said, "Did we have a grant?" So I would just say that the single piece of advice from Reed is about distribution and figuring that out, or at least spending enough time. The second bit of advice I would say from friends and family is what I've mentioned before: is don't take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. And, and so I how do you do that? To, what do you do in your daily routine? Because it's hard to do that sometimes, especially you know you're a board member at the other places. People look to you for guidance. Um, how do you kind of level yourself? I, I agree. It's, it is very hard. Uh, and I cannot say that I have found the right balance because I, there's a fine line between doing your work seriously, but not taking yourself too seriously. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think the, the, it doesn't mean that by not taking yourself too seriously that you become less diligent in what you do or less hardworking. But, but the, some of the things that I find personally that help me are one, of course, being surrounded by good friends and family who remind you in a good way and that you can sort of laugh and do things that are outside or, 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 or I would say people who are doing completely different things. So, you know, people who are into music or art or doing something outside or orthogonal to what you do because you realize like that you, you do high just, altitude trekking. Right. Yes, yeah. or, or, or mountains and, you know, something that is so different that you don't feel like you're in your own sort of zone of, mm -hmm. of comfort and your zone of thinking. Um, and then the others are, are, are just, I find it great to just spend a little bit of time alone every day and go cycling mm -hmm. or yeah. running or whatever it is that people like to do, meditating. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. I just find that that is a very key way to just sort of switch off a bit. Yeah. And Manish, I really appreciate your time. I have one last question, but before I ask it, just tell people what you're up to now, where people can find you. Yeah. So, so Edmodo, as you mentioned, is, is the world's largest social learning platform for K through 12 students, parents, and teachers. We have 
over 32 million uh, users worldwide and we came here and we just i've been here just for a year and i'm um we came here through the acquisition that edmodo made of our previous startup called root 1 uh they can find me by uh just going to manish@edmodo.com uh, in terms of email and what i am doing right now at edmodo is i oversee uh three functions in the company one is sales so this is the sales team that goes out and talks to districts and schools mm-hmm. the business development team and what we call the platform partnerships we we have a, around 100 partners with 600 apps that are sold through our platform wow. as as a distribution mechanism it's amazing so that's that's what i'm doing at edmodo now yeah and so my last question manish is this um what's the worst and best part about working with your brother. <laughs> uh, that's that's a great question. And then I will send him this this clip so that you can be that's... as honest as possible. Yeah, I think I think um the hardest part is let me get to the hardest part okay. first. Is that to some extent we are complementary? I I mean to some extent we're complementary but in some ways we overlap. So we have we know others who work as brothers but you know one may be squarely sort of in the technical space or clearly in the technical space and the other person clearly in the in the so called business space but in in ketan and my case we tend to both overlap on the business side uh but even there at alpha smart what worked well is he focused more on sort of the product side and the the what we were going to do in the future and i worked more on the sales and the sort of the day to day uh stuff and that division seemed to work well so one challenge clearly is when we overlap sometimes that's in a bit of a tenuous situation right because uh, we're both sort of trying to do the same thing mm-hmm. um what's great about um working with your brother is he can totally be honest about things and and so and while I've been might... honest about you about what's that what's he been honest about you that no one <clears throat> that no one else would probably tell you i think i think um just he he you know i mean obviously we we know each other pretty well that if we already knows i'm uncomfortable out something it's like it's like your spouse they already sense that there's something that is not quite right and you know you don't have to really say something explicitly mm-hmm. and and that kind of understanding and it also is the same with with co-founders that you work for a while you get a sense for what they sort of jive with and not jive with yeah. and it's great is he knows he knows my weaknesses and i think that's always good to know not only yourself but for others who work closely so that you try to sort of you know sort of work in areas that hopefully are complementary and that you yeah. understand that everyone has weaknesses yeah. and that's fine so yeah. i think ha- knowing that always helps yeah manish thank you so much i know you have another meeting coming up so it's been absolute pleasure i really appreciate I- it Thanks a lot Jeremy it's been fun and I am truly honored. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye.